Hi everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm glad that you're here and I hope that this presentation has something to offer you. This presentation concerns the book Biegański, The Brute Polak Stereotype, its role in Polish Jewish relations and American popular culture. Before we get started, perhaps you'd like to sidle on over to the buffet table and grab yourself a light snack. Bugansky is a scholarly book. It's over 300 pages long and it's rather dense. So this presentation will only hint at some of the themes of the book. Bugansky is a book about how we talk to each other. It's a book about how we talk to each other about the Holocaust. It's a book about how we talk to each other about all hate, cruelty, and atrocity. It's a book about how we talk about anti-Semitism and all prejudice and bigotry. It's a book about how we talk about suffering, whose suffering matters, and what we do with suffering about diversity, about neighbors, and Bugansky is a book about hate. Bugansky is a book about how we talk to each other. Bugansky is not a book about how heroic Polish people have been. There are many such books, they're very good, but Bugansky is not one of these books. Bugansky is not a book about how much Poles have suffered, especially during World War II. There are many such books, they're very good, but Bugansky is not one of these books. In this image, we see Pope John Paul II and Rabbi Elio Toaf, Chief Rabbi of Rome, conversing with each other. We have a Pole and a Jew, we have a Catholic and a Jew, we have a Polish person and an Italian person. By the way, I'd like to make a note on terminology. In Polish Jewish relations, the terms Pole and Jew are used by virtually all participants in the conversation. These terms are not meant to denigrate or to elevate anyone. They are terms of art. By Pole, we mean someone who has ancestors from Poland who were not Jewish. And by Jew, we mean someone whose ancestors were Jewish. And yes, we acknowledge that someone can be both Polish and Jewish. When a Christian and a Jew talk to each other, it can be a minefield, a no man's land, because a stereotype hovers over the conversation. The stereotype is of Shylock. It's a stereotype of Jews as greedy, whiny, conspiratorial. And we do everything we can to avoid in our conversations invoking the Shylock stereotype. We do everything we can to avoid feeding into the Shylock stereotype. Something similar happens whenever a black person and a white person talk to each other. It may seem like there are only two people in the conversation, but unfortunately, there are stereotypes present in these conversations as well. There are stereotypes of black people as lazy, less intelligent, violent, and unclean. There are also negative stereotypes of white people as privileged, racist, oppressive, and ignorant. What happens when Poles and Jews talk to each other? And these photos are photos of my Facebook friends who claim either Polish or Jewish ancestry, and I am very grateful to them for contributing their photos for this presentation. So we have a Pole and a Jew engaging in conversation. What are the minefields? 
when a Polish person and a Jewish person talk to each other? What are some stereotypes we need to be careful about? The Polish people and the Jewish people I know in my own life are good people and they want and they work for good relations between Poles and Jews. This emblem showing an Israeli flag and a Polish flag united in solidarity I got from Lech Wałęsa's Facebook page. So when Poles and Jews talk to each other, there is often a bit of a minefield. The minefield is the Shylock stereotype hovering in the background. This stereotype comes up in many topics that Poles and Jews need to talk about. For example, the middleman minority status of Jews in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Jewish members of the communist security apparatus, the Jews who collaborated with Soviet invaders, and the lack of Jewish assimilation as measured by the percent of Jews who spoke Polish as a first language. When we talk about these topics, we want to talk about them in a responsible, non-inflammatory way, in a way that does not feed into the stereotype. In other words, we walk on eggshells. Not everyone is so careful. There are some people who are anti-Semites and they do everything they can to feed into the Shylock stereotype. One typical tactic of anti-Semites is to comb through the Talmud and to cull quotes to prove that Jews do bad things because they are Jewish and because their religion tells them to do bad things. For other people, negotiating the minefield is challenging. Agnieszka Holland is a brilliant filmmaker. I mention here just two of her films, Europa, Europa and In Darkness, both of which deal with the Holocaust. Agnieszka Holland was born in Poland. Her mother was a righteous Gentile. Her father was a Jew. Because she was born in Poland and she is familiar with Polish history, she has expressed impatience with how people who are not from Poland talk about Polish history. She complained especially about Claude Landsman, maker of the film Shoah. Mr. Landsman thinks he owns the story of the Holocaust and I suspect that he hates every living Jew. The fact is there were communist Jews who worked for the secret police after the war and tortured Polish patriots and so on and so on. Jews are not without guilt, Holland said to the New York Times in 1993. Michael C. Steinloff is author of the book Bondage to the Dead, a very excellent book which I recommend to anyone interested in Polish-Jewish relations. Steinloff's parents were Polish Jews who survived the Holocaust in Poland. In his book, Steinloff acknowledges that after the Russians invaded Poland in 1939, at the same time that the Nazis invaded Poland, some Jewish people did greet Soviet invaders with bread, salt, flour, and even kisses. When we talk about these difficult aspects of Polish-Jewish relations, we emphasize that not all Jews did bad things and that they did not do bad things because they are Jewish. We might say something like, yes, some Jews did collaborate with Soviet invaders, but we must understand this in the context of the Polish anti-Semitism that existed in the interwar era. In other words, these Jews had been traumatized by anti-Semitism from Poles, and they saw Russians as a better option. To avoid feeding the Shylock stereotype when talking about difficult topics, 
We acknowledge that controversial behavior was limited by history and geography, that is, space and time. We acknowledge that not all members of the group in question participated in the controversial behavior. We acknowledge that any person of any ethnicity or religion might behave similarly under the same circumstances. Ukrainians are Slavic people just like Poles. Ukrainians are Christians just like Poles. Ukrainians did collaborate with Poland's invaders and Ukrainians murdered and tortured Polish people. So it was not just Jews who greeted invaders. And we don't attribute negative behavior to any ethnic or religious this strategy of not associating negative behavior with an ethnic or religious identity is exemplified in this Atlantic Monthly article by Michael Kinsley at a time when some Jewish people committed high profile financial crimes. The Atlantic Monthly instructed us how to think about Jewish bankers. The bottom line, don't assume that Jews did bad things because they are Jewish. And you can find many examples of this strategy on the web. Here is an article from the tablet talking about how anti-Semites use the Talmud to negatively characterize Jews and Judaism and how anti-Semites can be logically defeated. Well, we do everything we can to defeat the Shylock stereotype when talking about Polish-Jewish relations. Unfortunately, the Shylock stereotype is not the only stereotype that haunts Polish-Jewish and Christian Jewish relations. There is another stereotype, that is the Biegenski stereotype. I argue in my book that the Biegenski stereotype haunts all conversations. Yes, I argue that this is a universal stereotype. Biegansky, the brute Polak, is more animal than human. Biegansky is brutal, violent, stupid, ignorant, dirty, primitive, unevolved. Biegansky is hateful, bigoted, chauvinistic, superstitious, specifically Catholic, inferior to clean, educated, modern, multicultural, secular people. Biegansky, the brute Polak, is responsible for the Holocaust and maybe all hate and atrocity. In February of 2018, the Ruderman Family Foundation, a charity dedicated to the needs of the disabled, released a video in which Jewish people stare into the camera and repeat the words Polish Holocaust over and over again. One message of this video is that Polish people are responsible for the Holocaust. The Ruderman Family Foundation also recommended that the United States suspend relations with Poland. The Israeli embassy in Warsaw released a statement asking that the video be withdrawn, and it was withdrawn. <clears throat> At the same time, in February 2018, celebrity lawyer Alan M. Dershowitz published in the Wall Street Journal an article arguing that Polish Catholic Church sermons contributed to the Holocaust. On his Facebook page, Dershowitz posted a photograph of Auschwitz. This is a metonym. Auschwitz equals Poland. Auschwitz equals church sermons. 
Auschwitz equals Catholic. I ask, what's the difference in logic between Alan Dershowitz saying that Poles do bad things because of Catholic Church sermons and anti-Semites saying that Jews do bad things because of the Talmud? This is a real question we need to think about and talk about. Later, Christopher R. Hill, a former U.S. ambassador to Poland who is now with the University of Denver, called a Polish law regarding speech about the Holocaust and condemning associating Poland with Nazi Germany, the revenge of the peasants. That's right. An American ambassador to Poland called a Polish law the revenge of the peasants. Revenge of the peasants is an allusion to this 17th century French print that depicts peasants torturing, stripping, beating, impaling, and lynching their victims. An ambassador, a man assigned to be diplomatic, to, to make friends with the Polish people, depicts Polish people as peasants committing atrocities. As mentioned, Ambassador Hill is now with the University of Denver. He is the advisor to the Chancellor for Global Engagement and Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy, a man who called Polish people vengeful peasants, is now teaching American students about diplomacy. The Bieganski stereotype essentializes a negative quality is associated with an ethnic or religious identity. When well-meaning people talk about Jewish collaborators with the Soviets, we must say that that collaboration was something that some Jews did in response to local temporary conditions. Team Bieganski insists that being an anti-Semitic monster is something that all Poles are because of their essence, regardless of time, space, or local temporary conditions. One of my most memorable Bieganski experiences occurred on the campus of the University of California at Berkeley, one of the best universities in the world. A secular Jewish American scholar told me that he could not believe that I am Polish and Catholic. Why, I asked him. This was his answer, because you read. Even grad school can be no man's land for the ethnically incorrect. Bieganski is everywhere. Bieganski makes an appearance every time a Polish leader opens his mouth. The leader may be aware of it, and he may not be aware of it, but Bieganski is there. Bieganski is present when Poles talk to Jews and when Jewish leaders talk about Polish-Jewish relations. The Jewish leader may be aware of it, and he may not be aware of it, but Bieganski is there. Bieganski, like a ghost one cannot exorcise, made an appearance when the White House honored a great hero, Jan Karski. President Obama unintentionally referred to Polish death camps. This created an international scandal. But, but, but no one stereotypes Poles. I'm sorry, but people do stereotype Poles. Read the book, Stereotyping of Poles is extensively documented. Bieganski in American cinema. Bieganski in the press. Bieganski in the highest level of conversations between international scholars about the Holocaust and World War II. Bieganski in documentaries broadcast via public television. 
Bugansky in private reminiscences of the informants I interviewed. Some Poles know they are stereotyped, and they attempt to address the stereotype by talking about how much Polish people have suffered. Polish people have suffered. These books document that. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum devotes time and energy to documenting the suffering of Poles during World War II. The Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum also documents Polish suffering. Auschwitz was first built and first used to torture and murder Poles as Poles. That's what Auschwitz was used for for the first 18 months of its existence. The numbers here are overwhelming. Jews are, of course, the primary victims killed at Auschwitz, 1.1 million. We respect that. We must also respect approximately 11% of Auschwitz victims, the second largest national group, Poles, 140,000, approximately 70,000 died. Unfortunately, to Team Biegansky, Polish suffering does not matter. James Carroll is a former Catholic priest, and I think he is Irish American. And his ethnicity matters because some people say that the Biegansky stereotype is a Jewish creation. That is absolutely not true. Biegansky is not exclusively Jewish. It is universal. And this former priest had a huge success with his book, Constantine's Sword. It received brilliant reviews and many sales and many awards. In this book, James Carroll belittles Polish suffering. He says that throughout the writing of the book, he is metaphorically at the memorial at Auschwitz to Polish victims. James Carroll misrepresents how many Poles died at Auschwitz. He gives his reader the impression that only 150 Poles died at Auschwitz. More importantly, he says that Poles imagine themselves to have suffered, whereas he says that Jewish people really suffered. Team Biegansky belittles Polish suffering. Here is James Carroll. In the background, you see what Warsaw looked like at the end of World War II. Nice Polish people shooting for good relations between Poles and Jews point to the fact that the largest number of rescuers of Jews honored at Yad Vashem are Poles. That's almost 7,000. And everyone agrees that this number is too small because not all those who helped Jews are included in the number. For example, many of the people died before they could be honored. Again, that Poles helped Jews doesn't matter to Team Biegansky. Eva Hoffman is the daughter of two Jewish Polish Holocaust survivors. She wrote this excellent book, Shtetl, which I recommend to everyone interested in this topic. In her book, she quotes a survivor telling her a story in which Poles helped this survivor survive the Holocaust, but the survivor concludes the story by saying, now you see why we hate the Polacks. Yad Vashem mentions that the largest national group who helped Jews are Poles. But then Yad Vashem belittles that number and says it's too low. Yad Vashem fails to mention that circumstances in Poland were worse than they were in any occupied country, that Poles themselves were targeted for genocide as described in Nazi General Plan Ost, and that Nazis decreed a death penalty for an entire family for any aid given to a Jew, including a glass of water. Here's an article in The Economist, which refers to
to Poles who helped Jews as precious few. And there's this book, They Were Just People, which purports to be a book about Polish rescuers, but that depicts Polish rescuers as monsters. This is a university press peer-reviewed published book written by two people who are not experts in the field. And you can see my Amazon review of the back in the background and also a letter that I and co-signers sent to the University of Missouri Press protesting this book, which is still being sold. Again, this book depicts Polish rescuers of Jews as monsters. When I was conducting the interviews for my book, I interviewed a woman who was codenamed Karen. Karen told me that her mother regarded Poles as, quote, very enthusiastic executioners. Karen told me that her mother blamed the Poles for the Holocaust more than the Nazis. I asked Karen if she knew about Zagota, a Polish organization formed to help Jews. I have been told it was the only government-sponsored underground group in occupied Europe whose express purpose was to aid Jews. Karen said, well, maybe that's what Polish historians claim. But look at Poles and Poland's intense appreciation of Jewish culture. I first visited Poland back in the 1970s. Poland was a pretty tough place back then. I've lived in Africa and Asia, and Poland was harder, believe it or not, than poor countries in Africa and Asia. I met Polish people who were studying Yiddish. They did so because they were aware of the Holocaust and they felt that Poland without a Jewish cultural presence was incomplete. Here is a book that was published in 1987, before the end of communism, before tourists began to visit Poland. In this book, you can read about woodcarvers in distant villages who say that they carve Jewish people because they want to defy the Holocaust. One man said, they were good people who looked after me and trained me I make these wood carvings in honor of their memory. I believe that when you feel sympathy for someone who has played a role in your life, you should attempt to portray some of it. It is my aim not to let the traces of this ancient culture sink into oblivion. This is a man living on a farm, carving wood for his own entertainment, consciously commemorating the lost Jewish presence. I was able to find only two photographs of the woodcarvers mentioned in that book because they were small peasants living in remote villages. But Poland's appreciation of Jewish presence is not limited to this or that person. It's nationwide. The Krakow Jewish Festival is said to be the largest and oldest such festival in the world. The Poland Museum in Warsaw commemorates Jewish culture. You might think that this would inspire Team Biegansky to decide that Poles have some appreciation for Jewish culture. And yet commentators have called Poles appreciation necrophilia, vultures, imperialism, cultural appropriation. One man wrote I wish I could believe that the Poles are different from the country that killed 99.9% .9 of its Jews during the Holocaust. This man is incorrect. Poland did not kill 99.9% .9 of its Jews. Nazis did. To say otherwise is to rewrite history. But look at how heroic we have been. Indeed, these books contain examples of heroism that are unmatched in history. It doesn't matter to Team Biegansky. This is Władysław Bartoszewski. 
He was an Auschwitz prisoner. He was released from Auschwitz due to a Red Cross intervention. After he got out of Auschwitz, he went to a Catholic priest and said that he was deeply troubled by his experience there. The priest said that he needed to help other people. During the Nazi occupation, Bartoszewski co-founded Zagota, which again is the only government-sponsored group dedicated to helping Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. Bartoszewski fought in the Warsaw Uprising. After the war, when Jews were being persecuted by some Poles, for example, in the Kielce pogrom, Bartoszewski actively protested the Kielce pogrom in league with others in the Anti-Racism League. He was imprisoned by the Soviets. He was a friend of Lech Wałęsa. He was an honorary citizen of Israel. He's a real hero. None of that matters to Team Bieganski. In November 2000, he visited the Israeli Knesset and he was insulted. He was similarly insulted by Germans, the very people who invaded Poland. All they could see was Bieganski, the brute Polak. To Team Bieganski, any good Pole, any heroic Pole, can only ever be a token, a black swan, the exception who proves the rule. No amount of black swans will prove to Team Bieganski that Poles are anything but Bieganski. So no, talking about how much Poles have suffered or about Poles aiding Jews or about how noble Poles have been will do absolutely nothing to address the Bieganski stereotype. There's one more strategy that some Poles use. It's denial. They deny Polish anti-Semitism. They deny bad things that Poles have done. They say that Poland is the paradise of the Jews and paradise of the Jews was an international name for Poland for many centuries. Denial won't work. If you want to be proud of Polish heroes like Tadeusz Kosciuszko, you have to be ashamed of the Kielce pogrom and all other Polish sins in relation to Jews. I say this clearly in my book, as you can see from the pages on the screen. The image on the screen is a blood libel mural in the Sandomierz Cathedral. There is an explanatory text, but the mural should be removed. Yes, Poles have done bad things. The point of Bieganski is not that no Poles have ever done any bad things. The point is that the bad things Poles have done are talked about differently than the bad deeds done by members of other ethnic and religious groups. It really is all about how we talk to each other. Some people try to resist Bieganski by being hip. Bieganski was old, rural, dirty, Catholic, uneducated, of the past, a chauvinist. Hip people are young, urban, they bathe, they're atheists, they have advanced degrees, they're modern, they're multicultural. Sorry, but that approach just won't work. It's factually wrong, it's morally wrong, and it has absolutely no impact on Bieganski. In my book, I talk about an interview I did with a young lady named Lauren. She said that she knew Polish people in real life and that they were clean and white collar and intelligent. But in her mind, she thought of Poles as big, beefy people, not educated peasants. Bieganski, the brute Polak, is a hater and he commits atrocity because he is all of the above. He's brutal, violent, stupid, ignorant, dirty, etc. We can get him to stop doing bad things by dragging him out of his village, giving him a shower, a college education, and convincing him to abandon his primitive Catholic religion. Or maybe we can't because his evil is, as the quote shown on this page says, deeply in grain. What should Poles do? 
Poles should do what other groups have done. Homosexuals, women, Jews, black people have all resisted their stereotyping. They've mandated curricula, they've built museums, they've made movies that tell their side of the story. Poles have just not done that job very well. And one example is Irina Sendler, who rescued approximately 2,500 Jews during the Holocaust. She was a Polish woman. Poles were not telling her story. Her story was forgotten and unknown. Who rescued her story? Some high school students in Kansas. They wrote a play about her. The play became popular. Suddenly, people started talking about Irene Sendler. In Poland, in recent days, a Catholic priest protested against naming a school after Irene Sendler because she was Jewish and a feminist. Except that she wasn't Jewish, she was Catholic, and God bless her for being a feminist. So in other words, this Catholic priest, in addition, in addition to being a misogynist and an anti-Semite, is tamping down the telling of the story of a Polish hero. And yes, people protested against this Catholic priest's statement. Polish people protested. This cartoon was posted at the priest's Facebook page. The cartoon says, there's no room for Jews in our church. And as you can see, the Jew in question is Jesus Christ. Another reason that Poles are not that great at telling their own story. Poles, too, are subject to being members of Team Bieganski. Poles, too, sometimes think that peasants are brutal and evil and wicked. This is a scene from a movie that Andrzej Wajda made based on a play by Stanisław Wyspiański. It's about a Polish poet who married a peasant girl in order to mend the rift between Poles and Jews. And on the screen, you can also see a page from my book that quotes the play. And you may be asking, so what? Who cares? Who cares if people stereotype Poles? That's a problem for Poles. It's not my problem. Well, this what? This is a blog post by me at Biegansky the blog that talks about how important Poland is to Jews and how important Jews are to Poland. Poland and Jews matter to each other. Eva Hoffman said that the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was multiculturalism before the word multiculturalism was invented. If Poles and Jews can't get along, maybe nobody can get along. If Poles and Jews can get along, maybe everybody can get along. There's another reason you should care about the Bieganski stereotype. As I said, this tendency to attribute negative behavior to the poor is universal. In America, we call our scapegoated other white trash, trailer trash, redneck, hillbilly, okie. Recently, WNYC, an NPR radio station, broadcast about white supremacists in America. Experts said that America has a hard time understanding white supremacist Richard Spencer as a threat because Richard Spencer is clean, well-spoken, and well-educated. Americans assume, an expert said, that racists are, quote, toothless. That is, they have no teeth because they are so poor and dirty. Another reason you might want to care about the Bieganski stereotype. You are a human being. The criminal in this photograph shooting a mother and child at close range is a human being just like you. And you want to understand how the hell a human being could do something so evil. And here's a Wikipedia text about this photograph. This photograph was rescued from oblivion by Polish underground fighters. 
Someone had tried to send it through the Polish mail and they intercepted it. They published it after the war in a book called We Have Not Forgotten. And some Germans said that the photograph was inauthentic, but these Polish underground fighters were able to authenticate the photograph. And here is the book that was published not long after the war. And I mention this because some people say that the Poles don't think about the Holocaust or they don't think about World War II. Poles think about it, believe me. Piagansky is convenient. He is the one who does all the bad things while the rest of us are innocent. We're clean, we're modern, secular, urban, well-educated. We are nothing like Piagansky. Well, guess what? The Nazis were clean, modern, and well-educated. Joseph Goebbels had a PhD. Josef Mengele had a PhD. Werner von Braun was such a fine scientist that NASA forgave him his Nazi crimes and recruited many other Nazis in Operation Paperclip. Albert Speer was a university-educated, world-class architect. Alfred Rosenberg, major Nazi theaters, uh, theorist, had a PhD in engineering. Heydrich, one of the worst Nazis, was a child of a highly cultured, well-educated home. And here you see a page from my book that documents how highly educated many leading Nazis were. I ask you, of course I want you to read my book, but I also hope that you will read this essay against identifying Nazism with Christianity. Nazism has a unique intellectual and ethical history. The Nazis themselves stated in no uncertain terms who inspired them. You can learn about Nazi intellectual and ethical history if you read this essay and believe me, Nazis are not citing Catholic church sermons. And if you don't want to read the essay, you can hear me interviewed in this radio broadcast. If we want to understand that man who shot a mother and child at point-blank range, this photograph helps us to understand, while the Bugansky stereotype obscures understanding. These are Nazis massacring Polish civilians in Bochnia. Here are Nazis massacring Polish civilians in Leszno. Here are Nazis standing over the bodies of Polish peasants. Huh, wait a second. Bigainski tells me that the Pol Polish peasants are the ones responsible for the Holocaust. And yet here we see Polish peasants lying on the ground. This photograph says to us that perhaps that Bigainski stereotype is not so accurate. A Nazi plundering foodstuffs from a Polish peasant family. Wait a second, Alan Dershowitz said that Catholic Church sermons caused the Holocaust. Here we see Polish priests in Bydgoszcz lining up before their slaughter. Here we see a Polish priest being shot to death by a Nazi. Here we see Antoni Zawistowski who was tortured to death in Dachau. And what about these pictures? In 1940 to 1942, Nazis murdered 2.8 million Soviet POWs. The Nazis murdered more Soviet POWs than Jews in 1941. How do we understand the Holocaust through Bugansky when we confront photographs like this? I teach. Every semester, I ask my students, who were the first and last people Nazis murdered as part of a government-sponsored program? None of my students, all of whom have had a conventional education in Holocaust history, know the answer. The fact that my students don't know that the Nazis' first and final group victims were handicapped people as part of the T4 program 
tells me that my students have not been educated about what Nazism really was. A positive review of my work appeared in the journal American Jewish History. The reviewer said that my work gives the illusion of absolving those who failed in their own test of humanity by placing the blame on easily identifiable others. Who exactly are we absolving? We are absolving Nazis. Not just after the war, but believe it or not, even during the war, there was a push to reintegrate Germany into the community of nations. This blog post, blog post about the movie Decision Before Dawn records one such effort. But there's no lack of movies that work on depicting Nazis, not just Germans, no, not just Germans, but Nazis themselves in a positive light to the moviegoer. And here are just a few of my blog posts on this topic. And here are a few more of my blog posts on this unending exculpation and absolution offered not just to Germany, but to Nazi Germany. In his excellent book, another one of those books that I want everyone to read, The Seventh Million by Tom Segev, Segev quotes a Holocaust tourist in Poland, and you can see uh, a page from my book on the screen. This Holocaust tourist says, well, we've forgiven the Germans. We have to blame somebody, so let's blame the Poles. My piece in Haaretz quotes Fania Fenelon, a, an Auschwitz survivor, who refers to Poles in Auschwitz as monsters, pigs, bitches, pests, and cows. In that same book, Fania Fenelon speaks of the elegance and handsomeness of a Nazi officer. So once again, our plan is to say that the people who do bad things live in the past, they're dirty, they're rural, they're Catholic, they're stupid, but we're the cool hip people and we're young and we bathe and we're not Catholic, so we can't do any kind of bad thing. Well, guess what? Let's go back to the past, to the 14th century, and we find perhaps Poland's most philo-Semitic king, King Kazimierz. We go back to the 19th century and we find Eliza Orzeszkowa, who is a philo-Semitic writer nominated for a Nobel Prize. So no, the past is not where anti-Semitism dwells. The future is not the place where there's no anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is timeless. Well, you know, the Bigansky stereotype says that Catholics and nationalists are the ones who do bad things. Zofia Baniecka was a self-identified Polish patriot who saved Jews during World War II. Sister Gertruda Stanisława Marciniak was one of many Catholic nuns who saved Jews during World War II. So the people who tell you, well, if you're a Polish nationalist, you're probably an anti-Semite, or if you're a Catholic, you're probably an anti-Semite, no. The Ulma family were Catholic peasants living in a remote village. The entire family was slaughtered by the Nazis because they helped Jews. The wife, the husband, the six children, and one baby in utero. So the idea that being a peasant or being a rural or being Catholic or not being multicultural makes you an anti-Semite is wrong. Maria Maciarz, was a Polish woman walking down a hallway during World War II. She chanced upon a little Jewish boy who needed shelter. She took him in and surrounded him with love. She sheltered two other Jews. They called her Babcha, which means grandmother. I could not find her photograph on the web. Maria Maciarz is not a famous person. This is a generic photograph of a Polish grandmother that I found on the web. Maria Maciarz was illiterate she could not read or write. It's incorrect to say that a lack of formal education 
makes people anti-Semites. It's incorrect to say that education cures people of anti-Semitism or of any bigotry. Now let's make things really, really complicated. Jan Mosdorf identified before the war as a Polish anti-Semite. During the war, he helped Jews and resisted the Nazis. And he was murdered for this in Auschwitz. I mention him because the simple formulation, well, he was anti-Semitic before the war, so he just went along with the Nazis. Uh-uh, not true. Cardinal Holland wrote what is a very notorious letter, critical of Jews. During the war, he helped the underground extensively. Not only that, he was offered freedom and power by the Gestapo, and he refused it. Before the war, Maximilian Kolbe, a Catholic priest, edited a journal that occasionally published a small number of anti-Semitic articles. Kolbe did not write these articles, and he criticized the authors, but the fact remains that he was the editor of the journal that published these articles. He was arrested by the Nazis, threatened with death, released, and after his release, knowing the price he was about to pay, he aided 2,000 Jews fleeing the Nazis. He was imprisoned in Auschwitz where he died, giving his life for another prisoner. An Auschwitz survivor testified, he knew I was a Jewish boy. That made no difference. He loved everyone. He dispensed love and nothing but love. I will love Maximilian Kolbe until the last moments of my life. Those are the words of a Jewish survivor of Auschwitz. Zofia Kosak Schutzka self-identified as an anti-Semite, and we don't really know whether she was an anti-Semite or whether she just said that to get the anti-Semites to come over to her side during the war. But she co-founded Zhigota, the only group in occupied Europe devoted to rescuing Jews from Nazism. She was arrested and sent to out. So I'm hitting you with these examples to show you that the simple formulation, oh, this person said anti-Semitic things before the war, so this person went along with the Nazis, is not true. And things become really complicated when you read the diary of Tzalel Perechodnik, a Jewish man who knew Catholic Poles before the war. And he knew two men, Stasek and Stefan, who were Catholic and anti-Semitic. Catholic and anti-Semitic Poles during the war, helped Jews. And this astounded Perechodnik, and he said that this wasn't true of all Catholics or all anti-Semites, but it was true of Stasek and Stefan. Salo Perechodnik also knew a woman who was very liberal and said all the right things, and she was educated, and she was noble, and during the war, she turned on Jews. Not everyone who said critical things about Jews joined the Nazis. Not everyone who was a liberal resisted the Nazis. Perechodnik himself is a complicated and complicating person. He witnessed some low-class Poles do terrible things during the war. And I am not using the word low-class Pole in a classist way. I'm saying that when the Nazis invaded, they decapitated Poland. They concentrated on murdering priests, doctors, teachers, lawyers, anyone who qualified as a social leader. And so the people who were left were leaderless, rudderless, demoralized, living in a chaotic world. And these people did turn on Jews. And I have no doubt that some of the people who turned on Jews were anti-Semites. Perechodnik himself says that some of these people were merely opportunists. They saw their chance and they took it. Perechodnik joined the Jewish ghetto police in an attempt to save his life and save the life of his family. In other words, 
he became a collaborator. He collaborated with the Nazis, and he thought that that would guarantee his survival, but it did not. Perechodnik participated in the roundup that sent his own wife to Treblinka. And then, of course, he was targeted for genocide because that's what the Nazis did. They would allow Jews to collaborate for a while and then kill them. So Perechodnik escaped and he joined the underground and he fought in the Warsaw Uprising during which he died. There's another problem with Alan Dershowitz and Tim Bugansky's argument that Polish Catholic church sermons caused the Holocaust. There was another country that was arguably even more bigoted than Poland, a country that churned out inflammatory material demonizing Eastern European immigrants. And this material appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, and you can see some of it on the page there. It was written by Kenneth L. Roberts, a best-selling novelist. I have read these articles. They would raise the hair on the back of your head. They depict Eastern Europeans as animals. This racist country lynched African Americans who dared to vote. This racist country murdered Polish strikers at Latimer, Pennsylvania. This country lynched Leo Frank, a Jewish man. All of his lynchers were known. None of them were ever prosecuted. And the United States passed racist quota laws in 1924 that stayed on the book until 1965. The United States did not produce a Holocaust. No Nazism, no Holocaust. Alan Dershowitz is wrong. The Holocaust is not the product of Catholic Church sermons. It's the product of Nazism. If you want to understand the Holocaust, study Nazism. Stop exploiting the Holocaust to carry out a wrong-headed vendetta against Poles and Polish identity. Now here's a man who can really keep you awake at night, Franz Stengel. 900,000 murders were attributed to him. 900,000 murders. Why did he oversee the murder of 900,000 people? He insisted that he wasn't an anti-Semite. He didn't have anything against Jews. It was just his job. And he was good at it. And it gave him satisfaction. He joined the Nazis, and his first job was murdering handicapped people as part of the T4 program. He didn't have anything against handicapped people. It was just his job. Then he moved on to Sobibor and Treblinka. Gita Sereni, journalist in this interview that you see here, confronted him about his murders. And at first he said, I wasn't guilty because I had no intention of hurting anyone and I didn't dislike Jews. But during one interview, she did not rush in to help him in his own self exculpation. And he acknowledged his own guilt and he died of a heart attack within the day. All right, so I'm telling you that it wasn't Catholic church sermons that made Poles do bad things. But Poles did do bad things in the pre-war era, during the war, and after the war. And this picture is the burial of victims of the Kielce pogrom, which occurred after the war. Polish people stoned to death some Jewish Holocaust survivors on the basis of a blood libel. A child disappeared, and these Polish maniacs became convinced that the Jews had kidnapped the child in order to drink the child's blood. So if I'm telling you it wasn't Catholic Church sermons that made this happen, then what did make it happen? And yes, I do talk about this in detail in the book, and no, I can't go into detail in this program. But I can ask you to think with me about these three folks, Jakub Berman, Helena Wolinska Bruce, Josef Rosnainski. At the same time that these post-war atrocities took place, these three people and others like them were torturing and murdering and erasing the best people in Poland. 
These three people were some of the Jews who joined in with the communist occupiers of Poland in the post-war era, and they made it their business to round up people like Witold Pilecki, who again volunteered to go to Auschwitz to lead the resistance in Auschwitz, people like General Neil August Fieldorf, Emil August Fieldorf, General Neil was his nom de guerre. He oversaw the assassination of an SS officer. These two men were fighters in the Polish underground during the war. They resisted the Nazis. They were heroes. And the communist authorities, including Jewish collaborators, tortured them, murdered them, buried them in unmarked graves, and defamed them, went about a propaganda campaign of calling them spit-flecked dwarves. How could this happen? How could this happen? This is my country. This is Indiana. It's a postcard. Lynchers in the United States photographed their crimes and sent that photographic evidence of their crimes through the mail. If we try to understand atrocity as something that Polish people do, we are not understanding. If we try to understand atrocity as something that Jewish people do, we are not understanding. If we try to understand atrocity as something that black people do, we are not understanding. If we try to understand atrocity as something that Germans do, we are not understanding. And for most of my life, I have hated Germans as Germans. I've been to Europe several times and I have refused to go to Germany. And it was reading this essay by Otto Gross called Ripples of Sin that helped me overcome my belief that Germans are somehow more evil than other people. In this essay, Otto talks about being the son of a Nazi. If we try to understand atrocity as something that people like us do under a given set of circumstances, and we try to understand those circumstances rather than to demonize any given ethnicity or religion, we are beginning to understand. The theories that I talk about in Biegański, my book, help to explain events like the India-Pakistan partition. Up to two million people were murdered by their own neighbors with simple weapons like clubs and shovels. The theories that I talk about in my book, Biegański, could be used to help us to understand why Buddhists in Burma are committing a genocide today, right now, while you are looking at this image against Muslims in Burma. And yes, now we call Burma Myanmar. The theories I talk about in my book help us to understand the atrocities that Indonesians and Malaysians have committed against the Chinese people living in their countries. Let's smash the abacus that exists only to prove that in spite of this or that token hero, Jan Karski or one quote, good Jew, unquote, most Polish people or most Jewish people are essentially bad. Let's stop letting people exploit the Holocaust so to settle scores with this or that ethnicity or religion or social class that they don't like. Will there ever be peace between Poles and Jews? In Biegański, I quote two informants, Polish Mary and Jewish Matt. Both describe their parents as hardened survivors and difficult, wounded people. Confronting the scars of such folk, one is tempted to despair and conclude that there is no chance for peace. And this is the passage in my book where Mary talks about her family. 
The only common theme was poverty, hunger, and no opportunity. My grandfather would get drunk and abuse people. There were black eyes. In the season when they castrate the animals, my father was told he was going to be castrated. He had to run away and negotiate his return. He said if they ever said that again, he'd figure out a way to kill them all. My father would be willing to hit a cow with a board until the board broke or the cow died. It was not a culture of empowerment. The message was of disenfranchisement, of scraping on the edge of society. My father's father was threatened by any aggregation of power or collaboration among his own children. Power was gained through intimidation. It was a culture of street rats. It was a very low class level of behavior that continues to this day. They would steal each other's property like tractors. The sheriff got tired of it. It was usually the result of a grudge. I borrowed your hay fork two years ago. I returned it. You to borrow my wheelbarrow. You didn't return it, so I got your tractor. This was all said in an ugly tone. They had to nibble on the sides of society. There's not much ethics. You survive however you can, raising a few cows, a few fruit trees, moonshining, making sausages, making other different kinds of food, logging, trapping, cutting wood, selling it, dealing in iron and metals, knowing metals, knowing which metals are in batteries, knowing what's valuable, hauling gravel, knowing how to build a building, knowing how to make bricks, soldering, shoeing a horse, there ain't nothing we can't do. If we can't do it, we'll steal it from somebody. If we can't steal it, we'll watch it and learn how. Can do people. It's intimidating. I should know how to change a tire, the oil, rewire a house, fix windows. Why would you have to bring somebody in? You can trust no one. Everybody will rip you off. The world is full of predators and they will take advantage of you. That's Mary talking about what it's like to be the child of Polish parents. Here's Matt. My mother always struck me as having some kind of a wound that she has not healed from. Still not. She's 76 years old. Just some kind of... It's so easy for her to get angry at, you know, if she sees a Polish guy. And the anger is a cover-up for some kind of hurt, some kind of pain. And so she... It was a recurrent theme. The goyim. You know, them against us. I've always felt that my mother is running away from something. She's almost like an abused like she was abused as a child. She's always moving. When she would serve us dinner, she would not sit still. She was always getting up. She was always going out to the kitchen to get us something. She literally could not sit still. She was running away from something. It was almost like the Nazis were going to come at the door. I know she lost relatives during the war. I always had that sense that something in her got hard. These people from Europe, these people knew hardship. It was a totally different... My guess, just from what filtered down from my mother, survival was the big thing. Zag Gornist, say nothing. That's how you survived, say nothing. That probably was a very big survival skill in the pogroms. Okay, there is a joke my mother told me. I don't even know if it's a joke. And it's about a Jew being led to be massacred and his bandage is coming off. And another Jew says, don't make trouble. Her outlook on life was this sense, you know, they destroyed us, they tried to destroy us, they're going to kill us any minute, this fear. It was almost as if my mother was in kind of a wind tunnel, always like there's something going, the motor is going. The parents from the old country had this totally different personality, very hard, very survival oriented, very different values of ways of being. There was always this hardness about my mother, almost like don't feel, don't let yourself feel, don't be open. I'll make a confession. In fact, I spent many years in therapy, basically learning how to feel. So how do you make peace between these two groups of wounded, scarred, fearful survivors? You know, Polish people say, which means Poland is still alive as long as we are alive. And Jewish people say, Am Yisrael Chai the Jewish people still live. Both Poles and Jews have catchphrases that emphasize that they have survived the genocidal intents of their enemy. You have to be very strong to do that and you have to be very tough. And it's not easy to make peace between people who have had to be so strong and had to be so tough. I close the book with a legend about King Kazmierz 
who had a consort named Esterka. She was Jewish, he was Polish and Catholic. Some say they had six kids, three girls and three boys. The boys were raised as Catholics, the girls were raised as Jews. There's a play about their relationship and the play ends with the words, we shall die, but as long as your race and mine inhabit the earth, it is not ended. So whether Poles and Jews want to make peace with each other or not, they can't get away from each other. When I was working on Biegański, when I was actually writing the book, every morning before I began work, I would kneel on the floor and I would invoke these two people. Eliza Orzeszkowa was a Polish Catholic woman who worked for good relations between Poles and Jews. Janusz Korczak was a Polish Jewish doctor. I think of these two quotes, one from the New Testament, one from the Old Testament. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Wisdom is fairer than the sun and surpasses every constellation of the stars. Compared to light, she takes precedent for that indeed night supplants but wickedness prevails not over wisdom. Our shared scripture tells us that light defeats darkness. Marie Sklodowska Curie said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. I hope this presentation has offered you something of value. Before you go, let me pack up something for you to take home.